What's the purpose of NATO? NATO said the purpose is to prevent Russia from invading Europe. Well, if Russia was never going to invade Europe, why do we need NATO? Their very existence promotes war. They need to constantly turn up the fear. Otherwise, they don't get paid. They lose their jobs. It's as simple as that. You're looking at a, a situation that's just, it makes, it's stupid. I mean, the Russian people are no more interested in occupying in, uh, Europe than Europeans are interested in occupying um Russia or America and China, whatever. It's our politicians that that are the problems. The people, you know, we could care less. It's, I let me get along with my job and save my family and leave me alone. It's always the the, the politics at the top that that make wars. Uh, it, it's not the people. Um, we're just the sheep and follow. Uh, it, it's just unfortunate, but that's the real end of the game. Welcome to a new episode, Deep Dive with today, Martin Armstrong. Hi, Martin. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's a great honor having you. We met already a couple of years ago when our dear friend Markus Vetter premiered the movie about you, The Forecaster, in Stuttgart. And it's an incredible documentary about your life. And um, everybody who wants to watch the movie, the first 20 minutes are for free in a link beneath the video, in the show notes. You have to check it out. It's a, it's a, it's a thriller, actually. And we talked back then, and it was uh, amazing, actually. And you're a cycle guy as well as... Uh, As, as me, I, I, we love the cycles, we love the history, we, we are students of the history. And um, you made some incredible, incredible prediction and forecast. That's why it's the, the film is called The Forecaster. And to introduce it to our German audience, um, you, you, for example, yeah, you were the hedge fund manager of the year 1998, and you were co correctly forecasting the collapse of Russia, for example. Um, but also the, um, the your, your confidence model, also known as the Pi cycle model, um, predicted the crash in. 2000 and many more actually did i miss something marty well actually <clears throat> you can go to our site in 2013 we said that uh, our computer came up and said that ukraine would be the hot spot and that's where everything would start a year in advance i mean it's uh the computer has been absolutely flawless it's been quite astonishing um uh, but it it monitors the entire world And, and I mean, people want to, you know, sometimes ask about that. And, and I, will, I will say this. I first realized that it could, to, could do war. It wasn't designed to do so. It, it's monitoring capital flows. We had a client, the Universal Bank of Lebanon. Yeah. And they had somebody that had written down the Lebanese pound uh, every day back, to, you know, to, you know, mid 19th century. And they asked us if we could build a model. So I did and <clears throat> put it in the computer. And what came out was it says your country is going to fall apart in eight days. Wow. I thought something was wrong. I, you know, yeah. I called him. I said, look, something's going to be bad with this data. And very calmly, he asked me, he says, well, what currency would you recommend? I said, well, it says the Swiss franc. He says, thank you very much. And eight days later, the civil war began. Uh, the same thing happened when... We had a client in um, Saudi Arabia, and he calls and he says, Iran's going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf tomorrow. What do you think gold's going to do? I said, you tell me a war is going to start tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Um, so then, you know, by Russia, <clears throat> you know, we saw uh, basically 100 billion going in and 150 billion coming out. So I had stood up at our conference in 1998 in June. I said, Russia is going to collapse, and I give it about 30 days. And a guy from the London Financial Times happened to be there, yeah. and he put it on the front page. And then Russia collapses, and that kind of started the whole thing with the CIA and everybody else. But effectively, what this boils down to is that if you know you're going to start a war, you're going to move your money in advance accordingly. And the computer is picking that up. I mean, they can't say you did it versus me it's just looking at the capital flows you can't put a yeah. name on it 
but it has been incredible that way. And, and they, they actually used it after uh, 9-11. They were looking for people that bought puts on the airlines, you know, a couple of days in advance. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting. And it, it finally made sense that, you know, that's basically how it, it has picked up war. Mm. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. But, um, um, the model is known as the, the pie model. Um, can you tell us why, um, what is the connection between pie and the cycles? Well, <clears throat> um, the cycle that I had worked out, uh, I had initially found a, Uh, a list of international panics uh, in the Wall Street Journal published back in 1907. And it covered a period of 224 years, and there were 26 events. So I just, you know, divided that and it came up to 8.6. I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, most people assume the business cycle is about eight years. And uh, <clears throat> so I projected it out, started using, and it was happening to the day. And I couldn't rationally, you know, I thought, well, this is just an average. It shouldn't be working that way. But, I mean, th this model has predicted the very day of the 87 crash, um, the very day of the high in 2007. Um, long-term I mean, capital as well, didn't didn't you also predict long-term capital, the collapse of long-term yes, capital? Yes, it, it yeah, did yeah. that. It, it predicted when the communism would fall. Uh, the Japanese uh, collapse at the end of 89. And these are fixed dates. So it's not that you can mani manipulate them and say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're fudging it or something like that. I mean, you, it, they're projected out for, you know, a century. And um, so <clears throat> I was really trying to figure out why it was so accurate. Because it, to me, it just didn't make sense that why it should. And it turned out 8.6 years is 3,145 days. It turned out to be pi times a thousand. And then the more I, I checked into it, uh, everything, uh, <clears throat> the procession of the equinox is 25,800 years, which is three times, you know, pi basically. I mean, it's amazing how um, this works out on so many things. I mean, it's the number of seconds in a year. I mean, it, um, I don't know. It's just some sort of that. That's basically what it is. Pi is perhaps the divine cycle that governs everything. Mm -hmm. Did it ever fail? Did you ever make a wrong forecast, which not, not happened or? No, my, the only failures have been me personally not interpreting it, you know, saying, well, you know, um, who it would be or whatever. But I mean, I mean, it comes up with these dates. And, and for example, uh, Marcus did a film back in 2011. Yeah. Um, and I'm standing up there showing, okay, fine. Here's our, you know, the war cycle and it's going to turn up in 2014. All right, so that was the revolution in Ukraine. Um, if you had asked me, you know, 20 years ago, would I have ever imagined that the West was deliberately trying to create war? I would have said that's absurd. You know, um, and that's what I mean, that, that anything that's been wrong has been me personally interpreting something. Yeah, uh, but it's been a hundred percent right all the time, it, it, which has been remarkable. Yeah, um, you know, sometimes you just have to get closer to these events to see. Uh, I mean, I would have thought when it was saying war that you know some sort of invasion or something like that, and I don't know anybody that could have predicted that we actually have world leaders that are probably the best crop of worst guys ever in human history from all countries together and they're all just like cheering on war i mean i, I it's, it's quite astonishing to me 
It's yeah, it's 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 incredible. It's actually uh, mind blowing, and I can't believe it. I shake my head every day. And in in the movie Forecaster, um, um, I don't want to spoil the movie because guys, you have to watch it. It's incredible. I just watched it yesterday as a yeah, preparation for the day to talk to you, Martin. And um, yeah, there there is this. Uh, you have this laptop which um, all with all your forecasts which got buried uh, before you were imprisoned. And there we see the charts where you forecasted, for example, the dot-com bubble, the great financial crisis in 2008, like you already mentioned, and, and so more. And furthermore, we see a conference in 2012 where you forecasted the low in interest rates in the early 2020s, which actually happened, a presidential third-party candidate winning in the elections 2016. I would say it's Trump. And the coming war cycle had its highest bar in 2023. And you see the culmination, as far as I understand, between 2025 and 2027. So please tell me. Uh, so it means we have like three or five, six more years of war. And is the war getting bigger? Because, you know, money, when a monetary system dies, it mostly goes with war and, and, and um, revolutions. So what can we expect from the PI model and your models uh, for the next couple of years? <clears throat> Well, it's very interesting that I think that we have a, a situation where uh, we had <clears throat> what they made the movie on was basically I was <clears throat> solicited back then yeah. um, to put in $10 billion into Hermitage Capital Fund. And they wanted to <clears throat> effectively take over Russia back then. And it was the, the U.S. that... Uh, was interfering in the Russian elections. And that's why Hillary blamed Putin and all that stuff as retaliation. But um, they were they had blackmailed Yeltsin with the Bank of New York uh, scandal. And then um, they were trying to force him to step down. And this guy, Barisnovsky, one of the oligarchs, would take over. And from their perspective, they were looking at uh, getting you know, basically all the resources of Russia, you know, gold, diamonds, oil, everything. And the bankers were just, you know, licking their lips. And I was flat out right told, you know, look, we're going to have, uh, we, we have our shoe in or, you know, the next president's going to do whatever we say. And I said, I'm sorry. I just, my computer says it's not going to work. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've come to understand these people, why they blame me is because they're judging me by themselves. They try to manipulate the world by paying bribes and all these sorts of things. And so when they lose, their conclusion is not that my computer was right. It's just that I have more people listening to me than they do. Um, so that's why it's always been this battle between me and and. And these people, I mean, they just judge me by themselves. Um, and it's got nothing to do with me personally. Um, yeah, they put me in prison. And then when 07 happened right on the day of the model, uh, on the floor in New York, they were calling it Armstrong's Revenge. <laughs> um, so it, it's just, you know... It, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. And we, we really should be paying attention to how um, the world functions. And because everything's involved, it's uh, climate, uh, you name it, you know, I mean, even the nonsense we hear with the climate change, they make it sound as if we've done everything. And um, all you have to do is go back and read Cicero talking about, you know, how the pollution was so bad because people were burning wood. You know, um, I mean, I lived in London when all the buses used diesel. You had to hold your breath when you walked past them. Um, so, I mean, you know, these things have been taking place for a long time and most people would be surprised. But the first uh, Clean Air Act was 561 A.D., by the Emperor Justinian. Um, so pollution has been around for a long time. It, it's not something that's just fossil fuels. I mean, you burn wood, you get smoke uh, and CO2 and everything else. So it's, it's just that people focus on, uh, I would say the biggest problem in, in analysis is that uh, they want to reduce everything to a single cause and effect. 
and it's not. Uh, it's a combination of things. Um, you know, you take war, the Black Plague. I mean, the danger of war that we're pushing into is that what comes after it are usually plagues. Why? Because what happens is, is that people from one side of the world starts moving to the other. The Black Plague came from the Tartars that invaded in, in Crimea and then they were throwing the dead bodies over the walls and the Italians fled back to Italy and brought the Black Plague with them. Um, when the uh, Europeans invaded America, the Indians, uh, a lot of them died because they didn't have, you know, the same diseases. And likewise, the, you know, Europeans took syphilis back to, to uh, Europe. Uh, so <clears throat> all these things, you know, the Black Death, I mean, all these things usually come because of migrations. And, um, you know, that's why they call them the Asian flus and stuff like this, that some things start in different regions. And the more we are connected, the more they spread. Yeah. And... Um What what do you think the the war will escalate? Cause like in your model, um, it says it will um, yeah um, escalate in the next couple of years. Do you think there will be uh, like the NATO will be involved in the war in Ukraine, or will Russia invade um, Poland or even Germany? Uh, well, the big theory that they have is that they can uh, defeat Russia and they would never use any nukes. And they, part of the military type tactic, and they use it against Trump, you, you demonize um, the other world leader. And they did that to Saddam, they did that in, to Assad in Syria. Uh, and then it, it basically beats the war drums so that it's applied to all Russians, for example. Yeah, but... but Uh, if you look at what Putin actually says, he is, um, he is a moderate. Yeltsin, when they were blackmailing him, uh, you had the bankers blackmailing him on one side. But on the other side, you had the communists who had filed an impeachment motion and they wanted to take it back and reestablish the USSR. So Yeltsin basically turned to Putin because he was not a communist uh, and he wasn't an oligarch. And that's why he was so popular. It was kind of like Trump in the, in the, in the sense that he wasn't a, a politician. Um, so the danger here is that most of the threats from nuclear war, if you look carefully, they're coming from the people behind Putin. And... My concern is you remove Putin and you got a real problem. Uh, Putin is more of a historian. And there's a lot of criticism in Russia against him that the, he's gone. He was too soft on going into Ukraine. Yeah. He didn't call it an invasion. He just called it a special operation to protect the Donbass, which was supposed to have been given a right to vote and to begin with, to separate. Uh, and... Uh, they feel, you know, the hardliners, the old communists basically feel that he should have just went in and took the whole country. Uh, this is where it's a little bit different because Putin is more of a nostalgic historian. Uh, Kiev is actually where the Rus began. Yeah. So to him, uh, it is kind of Kiev is like uh, London is to Americans. And the thought of nuking it to, to Putin is, was not, you know, something in, in his ideal idea. But these other guys, they would have no problem doing that. Uh, and our computers coming up uh, with a very serious point in time. And this is, is pi. It's actually 31.4 years from the fall of the USSR. And that comes into play April 26th to, um, from when Ukraine broke and May, to, May 6th to, for Russia. Um, if 
Putin's going to be overthrown, I would be con very concerned about that period in time. And uh, all the information that I get actually from Ukraine, and it's not Russian propaganda, uh, I had put out initially, maybe about six months ago, that they um, had lost 100,000 soldiers. And of course, people say, oh, that's just Russian propaganda. You know, and I said, it's not, this is coming from Ukraine. <laughs> it's not from Russia. Uh, and then your leader of the EU said that. And then, you know, Zelensky made her take it out. Um, and it's now I've been told it's up to 250,000. It makes sense, Martin. But you know why? Because they already run the eighth mobilization, the eighth. Yes. You know, and they already take people which are over 60. So it, it sounds kind of desperate. So they take anybody they can find. And, and what's the problem here is that you're, you know, they're fighting for a strip of land that is occupied by Russians, not Ukrainians. I know. All right. Historically, um, the Donbass, Crimea, it's always been Russia. In fact, up to the river where Kiev sits on was the old Russian empire of this ours. Yeah. Uh, you know, so <clears throat> they joined Hitler uh, because Hitler promised to give them a country. And that's why they became Ukrainian Nazis. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, and they've, I mean, it's been all documented that, you know, that everybody has, apologize for the events of World War II. I mean, even Japan apologized for the comfort women to, in, in Korea. Ukraine is not. Uh, I mean, they killed some 300,000 Poles. Um, I mean, they wiped out anybody that wasn't Ukrainian. They were never prosecuted because they also were killing uh, Russians. And so the CIA actually protected them. Uh, and so now we have the same situation all over again. It's, it's just, it makes no sense. And, and I've even told them, I said, you're throwing everything away. You finally have your own country. And now you're putting that all on the line for the Donbass. It just doesn't make any sense. But their leaders are taking uh, their marching orders. Zelensky just does whatever, you know, he is told to do. Uh, and as I, I said, you know, but, um, Blinken just came out and said that no peace deal should ever be done with Ukraine handing back to Donbass. I mean, that was Vince agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you say he, uh, Zelensky does whatever he has, uh, he been told, uh, who tells him? Who is the? I believe it's 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 the neocons from the United States. I mean, um, I mean, I knew John McCain and. You can, you can see as soon as Trump was elected in November, uh, McCain went to uh, Ukraine in um, in December. Yeah. Before he was sworn in, promising all kinds of money uh, to to launch uh, a war against Russia in the Donbas and to fund their civil war. And there's all kinds of photos of him meeting with the heads of the Nazis at the time. And then when he got into, uh, Trump got, you know, sworn in, Trump refused to do so. That's why McCain hated Trump so much. Um, I was invited by Trump to, to dinner in March of 2020 down in mar a Largo. And I usually go to meet these various heads of state because I want to see eye to eye what they really are rather than, you know, the fake news per se. And I was actually, uh, impressed. Uh, he had said at that time he wanted to bring all the troops home from Afghanistan, but he was the first world leader, and I met many of them in for 40 years. He was the first world leader that actually said he was sick and tired of having to write letters to parents that their son died in Afghanistan. And he said, for what? He says, they've been fighting over borders for a thousand years. What difference are we going to make? So he was against the, the, the neocons, uh, and that's why they had to get rid of him. 
So was JFK. Uh, you can Google uh, Project Northwoods. They proposed uh, to kill Americans and blame Cuba to justify an investigation, you know, invasion there. And Kennedy said no. Uh, they took him out. He was against Vietnam. And recently tapes had just come out, you know, about Richard Nixon. And he was talking to the head of the CIA and he says, I know who killed John. And uh, next thing you know, the, the guys that actually broke into Watergate were CIA ex-agents supposedly working for Nixon. And they made sure he was gone. Uh, it, it's just interesting that the three presidents that um, were against them were, were all either assassinated or driven from office. Uh, talking about the inside job, what do you think? Who is uh, responsible for the attack on Nord Stream? Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. That is, it was, it's the United States and UK. Uh, UK seems to be, you know, linked at the hip with the United States and on things of this nature. Um, I mean, you can probably Google it and find out, but when The whole agreement uh, took place in 1955 between Germany and, and Russia. Um, the U.S. and NATO put on sanctions. You can't provide any pipe to them. Uh, this whole theory has been that they were, you do that, they'll make all this money, they'll build up their military, and then they'll invade. Uh, And they've never gotten it right even once. Uh, and as I said, there is a book out, uh, I think it's called Retrospect by McNamara, who was the neocon in, in Vietnam. And he's point blank uh, came out in the clearest conscience. He says, we were wrong. They misjudged Russia before. They thought Russia was, you know, really backing uh, North Vietnam all the time. And, and he says, we were wrong. We misjudge Russia all the time. Um, and he said, we should not be making the same mistakes again. I thought it took a lot of courage. And the only one of the few politicians I've ever seen ever come out and say I was wrong. Yeah, true, true story. There is a 309 year cycle consisting of three 103 year cycles, which is ending in 2032 to give birth to a new 309 year cycle, which is according to your model, a private cycle. So what will happen in the transition phase between these two gigantic cycles? Uh, basically, this is when it's the rise and fall of civilization. Um, okay. It, it's not as bad as that sounds. Yeah, it does. Uh, <laughs> Um, the last one basically was, uh, the birth of republics. That was the American revolution and the French copied it, etc. It was the overthrow of monarchy. Um, and <clears throat> unfortunately the founding fathers read Cicero, who was the fake news of the ancient world. <laughs> um, and they thought that Caesar was this horrible dictator and he wasn't, it was the exact opposite. Um, Caesar was a man of the people, the Popularis Party, and uh, Cicero was a member of the uh, Optimates, who was the oligarchy. And just look at it, you know, objectively. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon, all the cities opened up their gates and cheered. And <clears throat> the Senate and all those guys, they fled. They had to flee to, to Asia. Why? Because the people did not support them. Uh, there was a debt crisis and it was even worse than what we have today. Let, let's say you bought a house for a hundred thousand euros and, and you couldn't pay. And now they say, well, we're only getting 54. So we're going to take your children. And sell and save, you know, sell them in, in slavery to make up the difference. Uh, you know, uh, that was the type of debt crisis that Caesar was, everybody cheered that he was going to alleviate, which he did. Um, He didn't outlaw the, he didn't completely default on the debts. What he did was, he says that wouldn't be fair either. He, he took all the interest, whatever you paid uh, over the years, and applied it to, to the um, 
original loan. And so he wiped out the interest payments um, and to settle the debt crisis. But I mean, that's basically what was going on. It's not so dissimilar from what we have today. I mean, much of this that we're going through is also because of a debt crisis. Yeah, of course. Um, they they cannot. The so London, London bond market crisis that we saw recently. Then Janet Yellen came out and said that maybe the Treasury should be buying in the long term um, and swapping with the short term. What's happening is you have inflation rising. So central banks are raising interest rates. <clears throat> Why would anybody buy a long-term bond when you know next month they're going to raise interest rates and you're going to lose more? Yeah. So, you know, the liquidity on the long end has, has collapsed and they've all been moving toward the, towards the short end. On top of that, they're throwing money head over fist into Ukraine. So they see war coming. They see inflation. Why would you buy the debt of these governments? Um, and plus, since World War II, they've been borrowing year after year with no intention of ever paying anything back. So, you know, the major capital is starting to realize this. That's why you've seen uh, rises in, in uh, real estate, um, ancient coins, stamps, coins, whatever, you know, collector items, art. People are just, a lot of them are just getting money off the grid. Um, real estate agents I talk to here in Florida, people, you know, the rise in interest rates hasn't stopped anything. Um, what's happening is, is the high end market, they just, they're paying cash. So they're just wanting to get money out of the banks, etc., and just put it into something that's more tangible. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. So um, getting back to the cycles, the, the last Smiler Decree cycle topped out in 1929. Will be 2032 be equivalent to the top in the stock market um, in like in, in 1992, uh, 1929, um, but just more devastating. So will, will this be a, the big crash, the big one? Because your uh, long-term confidential model says the same, that in 2032, something will break. The end of civilization, the end of the fiat currency system, or what, what will happen? Yes, well, the currency system will, will collapse, and maybe even before that. Um, if, uh, if you look at 1929, It's actually a little bit opposite of what we have today. But um, when it when it broke, there was a shortage of cash. Yeah. So you had over um, I just published that there's a, you know, a kind of a rare catalog that's, that was published back in 1984. But there were over 200 cities in the United States that issued their own currency because there wasn't enough money to, to do any kind of a transaction with. So I think you're going to see uh, the same thing. History repeats largely because people respond the same way. doesn't matter what century. Um, and so we're probably looking at the separation of the United States, Europe. Uh, the idea of a euro is not uh, is going to collapse. Um, And, you know, centralized government, I mean, that's why communism collapsed. Um, I was actually called in uh, by China to help make the transition to capitalism. And it was a very interesting experience. I was taken to, to a facility and they were tracking absolutely everything, but they were not interfering. There were 249 varieties of tea. I had no, no clue there were that many in China. And they were basically looking at this and saying, well, why is this tea that's like a dollar here selling for five dollars over there? Uh, and I said, well, where's it, you know, coming from? It's here. I said, well, first you have transportation costs. And they go, oh, really? And I said, yes. You know, and then I said, people will pay more for something if they like this one versus that one. In communism, it collapsed because 
it had to be a dollar everywhere, even if it cost you ten dollars to get it there. Um, so you know this whole idea of, of equality and socialism, and it does not work because we are all different, you know. And um, you can't have the same price for everything, even if it costs a tremendous amount of money to get it there. I mean, you know, um, that's what free trade was about. You know, you shouldn't be growing heads of lettuce in the, in the Saudi Arabian desert that's going to cost $75 for somebody versus one they can get for a dollar somewhere else. Um, use your natural resources to, to the best benefit that you have. Um, and trade restrictions and things of this nature, um, they're the opposite. I mean, all we have to do is look at, at Rome, for example. How did a Roman peace, Pax Romana, last for a thousand years? It's very simple. Um, as long as everybody benefits, you don't bite the hand to feed you. All right. You want the, the economy to be integrated. Um, and that's what is wrong in how we're treating Russia. Uh, once the pipeline was established, Russia is not going to invade Germany or somebody else because it's relying upon that money as well. It creates the employment the people would not support it. Once you cut that off, now they do have an incentive to go in. They got nothing to lose, only something to gain. Uh, I mean, that's why Rome lasted. Uh, and it's a very simple lesson, but our neocons want everything on war. They think, oh, we build up all these nuclear arms and I've got more than you have, so you won't invade. That's not the answer. I mean, the answer is simply, you know, fair and free trade. Um, you know, China has risen from the ashes because um, <clears throat> the United States economy became the biggest because it was a consumer based economy. All right. Um, and low taxes, and everybody could do pretty much whatever they wanted. So then China could rise if it manufactured stuff that, you know, they could sell to the Americans. Germany, um, I mean, I was buying German cars from the 70s. I was buying Porsches and BMWs or whatever. Um, and that helped Germany, you know, rise from also from the ashes. You know, if you put trade restrictions on, oh, you can't do that, then how would you, you ever rebuild these economies? Um, the same thing with Japan. Uh, it wasn't that they had gold reserves or anything of that nature. They didn't. All right. And which shows that, you know, e even the gold standard is, is nonsense. Um, you know, money is basically whatever somebody's willing to accept and trade for something else. It's basically a barter type system. Um, the, the whole problem with the gold standard, that why it collapsed, is because you can't fix it. You know, they fixed the dollar at, at $35 a gold, but you then kept printing dollars. Don't you know, at some point, I think a five-year-old with a pocket calculator could figure out you're going to go bust. Um, but we get these politicians and, and they have no understanding of, of the economy or anything. And why they always want to be world leaders, I don't, I don't really know. Um, in Britain, when John Major overthrew Margaret Thatcher, he promised you know, not to devalue the pound. They put the pound in the ERM because they wanted the pound to go into, uh, into the euro. And... Soros started attacking the pound because they, they put it at such a high price, basically for political purposes. See, it's strong. Yeah. Uh, and Soros started attacking it. So they called me in. They said, you know, what's your computer say? I said, it says you're going to need about 10 billion pounds a day for at least about a month. And then maybe, maybe you'll, you'll, you'll hold it. I said, you've put the pound at too high of a level. You have to devalue. They said to me, we can't do that because John Major ran on the election promising not to. So I rewrote it. I said, here, have him say this. I'm going to allow the pound to float to seek its own level. 
That's not the valuation. Oh, brilliant. It's the same thing. But this is what you have to do. Uh, um, and this is why I've been called in by governments, because I understand the game. Um, it's, it's wordsmithing. You know, it's, uh, it's how you say things rather than, you know, it, it's not necessarily what you do, but it's, it's all political posturing all the time. So you model and you say the next couple of years will be volatile, will be bumpy. So what's the best way to protect your purchasing power in the next couple of years? Will the stock market go up heading higher till 2032 till your model breaks or will it be Eventually more volatile? You're looking at the, the situation of, of the United States with the, the capital, what United States was bankrupt JP Morgan had to lend a hundred million in gold in 1896. It was World War I that made the United States the financial capital of the world. By World War II, it had 76% of the gold reserves, official, worldwide. Why? I mean, because Europe was going through wars. If tanks are driving down the streets, you're not going to keep your money there. You moved it. All right, so it all fled to the United States. That's what made the United States the um, equivalent of Athens in the ancient days. You know, um, Athens de defeated the Persians, and so then they set up the the Delian League, and everybody paid tribute to to Athens. And then when they became too arrogant, they joined with uh, Sparta and took out the Peloponnesian Wars to defeat them. Um, we'll see the same thing. Um, the United States is too arrogant. Uh, and this, you know, the military that I have, I've listened to are not, they do not want to fight Russia and Ukraine. Um, the military says, this is insane. It's the politicians and the bankers that are pushing this. Um, and it's all about, you know, this posturing and they think that, They can take down Russia. What if they're wrong? They don't ask, you know, answer that question or even ask it. Um, but <clears throat> honestly, I mean, in studying military tactics, Russia should um, basically go ahead and nuke something tactically in, in, in Ukraine. China should take Taiwan at the same point. North Korea should go into the South at the same time, and Iran should start, you know, attacking Israel and, and Saudi Arabia. What are we going to do with that many fronts at one time? Yeah, but is this what the model says? Or of course, this sounds like World War Three. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not saying the model is predicting that, but I'm just saying that they don't take that into consideration because Nixon did his best to divide China and and Russia. And what Biden has done is push the two together again. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going in the opposite direction. So, I mean, I'm just saying if they were smart, that's what they should do. And that may be the end result when we're looking at 25 to 2027 period. So how do you invest in these times, in these crazy times of yeah, um, paradigm shifts and uh, volatile markets? So what would you recommend the audience to protect their purchasing power um, in perhaps collapsing um, fiat currencies? Well, basically, you want effectively anything other than government. Um, you don't want government bonds. Uh, you don't want um, things of that nature that... You probably should have some uh, in the United States while you still can. Uh, and um, <clears throat> because most likely what will happen when things start getting uh, serious is they put in capital controls. Sure, yeah. So you can't move money. Um, but effectively, it's, it's not even a question, you know, is gold going to go up or whatever. It's just simply that it's neutral. Um, <clears throat> gold rises not with inflation. That's all propaganda. Um, I mean, inflation's going up, you know, continually. I mean, the national debts have increased and gold went down for 19 years. Um, it's just a, a used car salesman's, you know, sales pitch. Gold rises when there is uncertainty with the survivability of government. And 
times of war, that's when gold rises. And I think that's largely what's been going on, you know, lately. I mean, since 1999, gold has, has reversed and started a longer term bull market um, development there. Um, and you know, you're probably looking at gold going up into into about 2037 uh, and into that. <clears throat> now, we're looking at the collapse of governments. So the, the I can tell you what they are. They think they're going to get out of this war is they know they cannot pay off the, the debts. They know they can't pay off the pensions. All right. So. The end result is that what they're really doing is <clears throat> they're just spending whatever they want to spend. So the, the spending has increased dramatically since COVID. And because they intended the fault, they really expect to create a Bretton Woods too. The IMF has already um, been staging planning for their own digital currency. Uh, and their dream is this uh, a digital currency that they can track absolutely everything. So if you hire a 16-year-old girl next door to watch the kids, where's our 50%? You know, um, how do you pay a 16-year-old girl next door to watch, the, you know, to babysit the kids while you go out? I mean, things are just changing. They want to know absolutely everything about everything we do. And, and um, I went behind the Berlin Wall in the late 70s before it fell. And it was very interesting to me. Uh, a friend of mine, <clears throat> the day the wall was up, he happened to be on the right side with his grandmother, and the, but the rest of his family was trapped. And um, so his cousin, she took us around town and showing, and, and it's, it reminds me of this cancel culture. Because if anybody was close, she would say, oh, this is our government. They take such wonderful care of us. And as soon as nobody was near, she would call them every name in the book. Um, and I see that today. So if, if uh, you know, canceling people over COVID, which was basically a test run for locking down people. But these, they these politicians just look on the surface. They don't really understand what they're doing. Uh, the inflation that is set in, in motion was created by the COVID lockdowns. Um, I mean, I had emails from farmers that had to kill 30,000 chickens because they couldn't get them to market. Yeah. You know, you created shortages. And that's why rising interest rates at this point will not stop this kind of inflation. It's shortages. You go to the store, some days there are eggs and some days there's not. Um, you know, so we're not talking about a speculative inflationary boom, you know, of the 70s. We're, we're talking about absolute shortages and rising interest rates only makes it worse. Mm. In, in the movie, The Forecaster, you said that the banks control the governments. Please tell us why. Because when the U.S. government started um, the Civil War, they, they needed to borrow money. And there was no national debt beforehand. So Lincoln basically turned to uh, Jay Cook, who used to sell, who was the biggest bond dealer, selling railroad bonds and things of that nature. They kind of called him the P.T. Barnum or the circus guy back then because um, he was quite a salesman. Yeah. So they turned to him to sell government debt. So that became the first primary dealer. And ever since, the government uh, does not actually sell the debt directly to the people. The banks, uh, you become a primary dealer, you have to buy X amount. And then um, the bank then resells it. So... The banks have been blowing up the market all the time. Uh, they're getting into highly, as I said, I mean, they were, they're always trying to rig the game. They don't believe in fair trades or free markets or actually even honestly trading. Um, 
I mean, in all the you know the phone lines are naturally taped in 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 finance, um, and they seized all the tapes that I had. I stood up in court and I said, this has got nothing to do with this case. This has got, you know, these tapes would, would basically lock up, you know, every banker in New York City. I mean, I even had tapes saying, okay, fine. We paid our bribes to, to the uh, Russian ministers and to pull back platinum and we're going to and rise it up. I mean, even Ford Motor Company wanted to file a suit over the manipulation of platinum. Um, this is what they do. All right, they want guaranteed trades. So when they blow up, um, besides have blaming me at, at times, then they just turn to the government and they say, well, if you don't bail us out, then who's going to sell your debt? So it's, it's turned into a, a, a corruption network. If if they make a billion dollars, then the SEC comes in and says, well, give us our cut. Oh, we charged them with fraud. Nobody ever goes to jail. And they paid a $100 million fine. You know, I mean, the governments are getting paid off. So they get all these fines, very nice. Uh, and they pretend they were actually doing something for society, and they're not. They're just part of the problem. They don't prevent them from doing these things. They actually encourage them. So the banks, you know, I mean, just look at FTX. I mean, the, you know, it was just one giant money laundering scheme. Um, that's why you won't see that go to trial. Um, with Madoff, um, I had a journalist call me and they said, oh, you said the bank was illegally trading in your accounts? I said, yes, that's all been documented. And they said, uh, do you think they were laundering money for the Russian mafia as they were doing in Madoff? I said, I have no idea. I only saw one side of the transaction, you know, but that's why the bank, uh, fortunately in my case, uh, I got all my clients together and I, and I got them to file suits against the bank in New York. So at that point, uh, HSBC had to plead guilty uh, and they had to return all the money to the to to my clients. Um, if they didn't do that, they would have said, "Oh, he was a rogue trader. He lost it." You know what? Same nonsense. Um, Nick Leeson with uh, you know that's bank scandal. Um, I had also owned a brokerage house in Hong Kong, and they wanted to open an account with us. And I said, "I want a letter from the board of directors to say what is his credit limit." I got the letter. So when they went, Barclays went belly up on everybody else, not me. I had the letter that said, this is your credit limit. All of a sudden they said, oh, we had no idea. You know, he was, he was doing things that we didn't approve and the, bank, and the bank's not responsible. I mean, it's the same scam all the time. Incredible. Yeah. Um, talking about scams, let's talk about the U.S. debt situation. Um, every time I look at the at the Fed balance, for example, or the debt uh, balance of the um, federal government, I'm like, wow, how long can this last actually? So what is your take on the current debt situation and on the um, policy of Jerome Powell and the, the Fed? The, the Fed? The Fed really is independent. <clears throat> um, him raising interest rates is largely because he has, that's the theory. They have no other uh, tool in their box there to, to handle inflation. Uh, and the net result is that the more he raises interest rates, the more the debt will increase. Uh, I had met with the Treasury back when Paul Volcker raised interest rates um, back in 1981. And I met with them. I said, guys, this is, you're crazy. The national debt's going to double within a, within a decade because of these interest rates. And very calmly, they said to me, yeah, Marty, but we'll be paying back with cheaper dollars. Okay, okay. you guys know what you're doing. That is it. I mean, um, <clears throat> this is basically it. But we're coming to the end of the road. And that's what this war is really about. You think so? Okay. Absolutely. So 
So what's what's your what's your take there? So what what's the development for the next couple of months or years? Please share it with us. <clears throat> Eventually, you know, what happened after World War II? All of Europe defaulted permanently on its debt, except for you know Britain um, went into a moratorium. Uh, South America defaulted for like the fourth time. Asia defaulted. China defaulted. They all got to start all over again. All right. And that was Bretton Woods. This is what they're trying. They think we can get all out of this, eliminate all the debt. And uh, basically um, have a new Bretton Woods too and restart. Uh, they don't have no intention of paying this stuff off. They had, they, They can't. They, they can't. can't. Yeah, like like you said in the, uh, when I watched the forecaster yesterday, you were having your first conference after having spent 11 years in prison because they, um, yeah, you you have to watch the movie, guys. I don't want to spoil anything. And there you say you you have studied all the currencies and debt systems throughout history, and there was never a country. Um, who who defaulted um, who not defaulted on their debts except one country Bulgaria so I think that was hilarious so um, there is only like couple of solutions within the system to get rid rid of the debt it's 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 inflation it's growth or it's war or or hyperinflation and so you think not this time they will choose war oh yes that's what this is all about it's the war is not coming from the military. Um, <clears throat> And um, this is all basically, it's not even well planned or thought out. Uh, and that's the real problem. They're, they're, they just assume uh, Russia would never use nukes. We can take Russia down. Uh, and that's why they, uh, the Minsk agreement they lied about. I mean, just think about that for a minute. How would you enter a, tr a peace treaty. Would you believe now, uh, you know, the EU and, and the US when you just renege on what the last time you did it? Um, so it, it shows that they, they're, they're dealing in bad faith. They have no intention of, of peace whatsoever. Um, and as I said, Blanken just came out and said it would be a major Uh, ridiculous, you know, it, it open Pandora's box if, if Ukraine entered a peace. They don't want peace. They don't, this isn't about caring about uh, Ukrainian people. The more they die, fine, we don't care. Um, they've told Poland that to build up an army now for 250,000 men. Uh, Germany's looking at reestablishing the, the, the draft. Um, This is war. These are politicians saying this is what we have to do. There's no way out of this. And I should point out that, you know, um, Klaus Schwab and his WEF has, has always been, uh, I guess, my nemesis to some degree. Um, uh, <clears throat> we both started just running around the world doing seminars with different people. All right. Uh, my client said, why don't we just do one big one for, so we held our first World Economic Conference in 1985. He holds his first World uh, Economic Forum, 1987. Um, his great reset is our 2032. Uh, when Marcus did the film on me, he then called Marcus and paid them to do the film, the forum on him. Uh, it seems like whatever I do, he's always copying it one way or another. But his great reset is just basically talking about um, R2032, but he's trying to make it fall in his direction, which would be a totalitarian state. You own nothing and you will be happy. Yes. Uh, and that would be another private or, or public wave, not private. So and he's not going to win. Um Plus, I mean, they don't understand why did communism fail? It, besides the central planning, all right, they need to control everybody. They don't want any resistance. And um, when I was doing my research at Princeton University, um, I became friends with a, a professor there who knew Einstein. And he said to me, he says, 
you remind me of Einstein. I said, what? And he explained, he said, I said, I'm not into physics or something like that. He says, no, 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 you don't get it. Einstein had always said that the key to everything is curiosity. He said, it didn't matter what field. He says, you were curious about what makes the world function economically. He says, he was just curious. To, to, and, and if you're not curious, you don't discover anything, no matter what the field is. And by <clears throat> eliminating that curiosity, and everybody has to be out of a cookie cutter, you eliminate all advancement. The only advancement that ever came out of the USSR was military. That was it. All right, you weren't allowed to create a hairdryer or something like that. Oh, gee, I can make a lot of money with my invention. There was no such thing. So you're, you're basically eliminating that curiosity. You're eliminating humanity itself. Uh, and without that curiosity, it doesn't matter what field that you're talking about. That's what Einstein was, was saying. If you're not free to think and just say, gee, what makes this work? All right. Um, you're never going to discover anything. So society cannot advance in such, in such a clamped down atmosphere. That's why communism collapsed. Uh, and that's what Schwab is trying to recreate. Communism, socialism, planned in, economies. In a, when Trump was elected, I can tell you that they, that's what probably sent panic through the world leaders. They suddenly realized that they could be voted out of power. Because he wasn't one of them. Um, and <clears throat> so suddenly democracy became populism. Evil populism. <laughs> um, they don't like democracy. Uh, we live in republics. We don't live in a democracy. I mean, that's all propaganda as well. Um, they say we live in a free society. We do not. We're regulated on absolutely everything that they can imagine. Uh, and uh, in a democracy, we should have the right to vote. Do we go to war with Russia? Yes or no. They make that decision, not us. And then what happens is they install a draft. You must go and now dive because we tell you to. Uh, you know, there's no... You know, in Vietnam, people were protesting because you could be drafted at 18, but you had to be 21 to vote. Uh, and they said, oh, you can be die for your country, but you had no right to drink or, or, to, or to vote. Uh, and they're doing that again. We have no right to, to vote. I mean, most people are like, who cares about the Donbass? All right. <clears throat> Give the Donbass back to Russia. Give Taiwan back to China. Will anything change in our countries? No. What are we fighting for? Where is our liberty at stake, our future, over these wars? It, nowhere. You know, you, you, our risk is basically what's the best thing a soldier can hope for? His upside is to return unharmed. That's it. You think Trump will run again for um, for the White House? I think he, he, yes, but I don't think he's going to win. Uh, you have to understand Trump a little bit. Um, okay. When he was growing up, um, people ridiculed him. Oh, you're just a rich boy. You wouldn't okay, have anything yeah. without daddy. Uh so that's why he became so confrontational, I think. And I think that's also why he wanted to become president to say, see, I did this myself. Okay. Yeah. Got um, it. And, but he never left that confrontational attitude. He kept it all the way. And I think, he, you know, a lot of people just don't like him um, for that arrogance and things of that nature. Uh, Yet everything he did was the correct thing for the country. Um, 
I mean, just look at what we have now. It's just, I mean, we don't even know what a woman is anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true story. True story, Marty. So, what, what, what is? Um, so, to summarize, um, it will be worse till 2032. But what happens afterwards? The private cycle will it be a golden era? Will it be a great future? Will everybody live in in happiness? And we have like a new currency? Or what's what's the prediction or the forecast? Yes, a, a private wave <clears throat> means that. Uh, we will recognize that the evils are from the government side. Uh, so we'll be much more cautious about that. And I hope that, um, I mean, the main reason I'm willing to do these things all the time is to help educate people that, you know, look, both sides are, are wrong at times. Sometimes it's the private side. Sometimes it's the public side. This time it's the public side, which is just out of control. And so hopefully the next time, what I believe we need is a direct democracy. Uh, um, the question, do we go to war, should be ours to answer. Uh, we don't need representatives that are bribed and, and, and do whatever the, the party tells them to. Um, but, the, I mean, I've worked on Capitol Hill. I know the way these, this thing operates. I mean, I could run for office and say, vote for me. I'll save the whales, women's rights, whatever you want to hear. I'll, I'll tell you. Then I get to Washington and then they go, well, we don't care about that. You will vote according to whatever the party tells you to vote. Yeah, exactly. And you, you look at these votes, they're always down party line. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's just a fraud. You know, like I say, you can, you know, oh, I didn't vote for him because he's against the abortion or this. It's irrelevant. Because it's the party that determines what that position is going to be anyhow. Um, so it, it, you know, we tend to think, you know, these people really care. And look, I, I've known many, when they first go there, they might be zealots and they are slapped down and, and they are told this is the way it is. I mean, there's a little meeting when you first get there and they, and they explain, you will vote according to what we tell you to vote. Period. Same in Germany. So direct democracy, very, very good, sympathetic. So what about the monetary system? What kind of mon monetary system will we have after 2032? Well, I would honestly suggest that we uh, end the borrowing. Um, and <clears throat> the a lot of people have misinterpreted the German hyperinflation. Uh, Why is that? Because they think the hyperinflation was simply printing money. And that's wrong. Uh, you can look it up, because Merkel was always wrong on that. In December 1922, the Weimar Republic basically confiscated 10% of everybody's assets. And they gave you a bond. Because um, they couldn't make the reparation payments. The hyperinflation starts after that. So if the government can confiscate the money out of your account and just take 10%, you suddenly <clears throat> were woken up that the government is the problem. If I leave anything else there, they might take the whole thing. So Germans started, you know, transferring the money into just about every other currency they possibly could. Um, when the hyperinflation ended, um, there was no gold, but the new currency, they, they used it to back it by real estate. So it's the, the hyperinflation, the printing of the money comes as a result of. It's not, you know, uh, the initial cause. Even if you look at Rome, uh, you can go to my site, I've published, I, I've took all the coins of Rome because they basically really are dated. Um, and I did, you know, the, the analysis on that. And what I found was that we had the situation of, you could see Rome, the monetary system collapsed in eight years. Yeah. All right. And what happened? The Roman emperor uh, Valerian was captured by the Persians in 260 AD. 
Now, he was the first Roman emperor to actually be captured and turned into a royal slave by the Persians. I mean, that was such a devastating shock. Um, it also encouraged the other barbarian tribes in the north just to invade. Well, if the Persians got away with it, we can. So all the invasions start after that. That's why they started, you know, the uh, persecutions of the Christians mainly. Because they thought the gods were mad at them because the Christians would refuse to, to, to honor them. So it, it, you know, it's the lack of confidence that starts the whole thing. Uh, once you lose faith in the government, then it just collapses. You don't accept their currency. You won't accept their bonds. This is what we're into. Um, so at the end of the day, what comes after 2032, off new governments, reorganization, what we have with them today, they will all be gone. Um, and... Hopefully we, you know, it will be a great reset in, in that sense, but hopefully we can push it in what our computer saying will end up with a private wave. So it will be back to us in power. And um, I say I would put in the precautions that uh, are very critical. I mean, um, we vote directly. Um, should we go to war or should we not? Um, I think that's so incredibly important after all these wars that they've just lied about. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can even check, I mean, the <clears throat> World War II, FDR kept trying to get the U.S. involved and Americans were were against it. And uh, he, they had broken the code. They knew the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor. And he wanted it to happen and use that as the excuse to say, see, we have to get in. Uh, there was a Senate investigation on this. They concluded, well, it's inconclusive. We're not sure if he really knew in advance or not. I mean, you know, they just whitewashed it. But it was a big enough issue that there was a Senate investigation on FDR and, and creating the war. I mean, weapons of mass destruction, uh, Vietnam, I mean, you have... Uh, tapes that have come out with Johnson saying for all he knew they were shooting at whales that night uh, I mean you go just go down the line I mean there isn't one war that they ever spoke about uh, that was that was true Lusitania they were they were putting arms on there when they were supposed to be neutral Germany put a, an ad in the paper do not sail on Lusitania it's going to be sunk and um, divers have now discovered that they're, you know, they found the Lusitania and sure enough, there was arms in there. Uh, so they've lied about these, not one war that I have investigated have they ever told the truth about. Yeah, um, the first thing which dies with a war is the, the truth, actually. Yes. And it's 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 true, unfortunately. So, what do you think? Will will the next monetary system will it be a gold backed system or will it be digital? And what's your take on Bitcoin? I think Bitcoin was actually created by the government. Um, um, it's the, it's their ultimate goal. They can track absolutely. You know, if I give you a hundred dollar bill right now, they don't know where I got it from. If it's in digital currency, they know who I got it from and that guy and that guy and that guy. It's <clears throat> ultimate uh, monitoring. So I think, honestly, it's a bunch of nonsense that, oh, some Japanese guy invented it and, and we don't know who it was. But if you invented blockchain, don't you think you'd be out there getting all the money for, for a patent? Um I mean, it, it's just, it, it's too convenient. Um, so, but why do they, but why do they start to create their own CBDC, central bank digital currencies like the uh, Fed or the ECB, if they already um, invented like um, the, the Bitcoin? Because the Bitcoin was basically just to get everybody acclimated that digital currency, uh, it, it couldn't come from the government side. Um, what they will do at the end of the game is once they introduce theirs 
then everything else would be illegal. Um, it'd be swapped in. It, it, you, at what rate? Who knows? But um, the U.S. did that. I mean, each state issued their own currency, and then when the, the revolution was over, they basically did the same thing. They issued the, you know, the dollar, and, and everybody converted to the U.S. dollar. And states were barred from issuing currency ever again. Um, I mean, <clears throat> currency is is it's a something the government does. Uh, the Byzantines would wage war against somebody for for counterfeiting it. Yeah. Um, so you have to understand that, that <clears throat> if they're interested in taxes. You really think that they're going to allow some sort of private currency to coexist? That would be the, I mean, uh, it's just not going to happen. I mean, Bitcoin was used by the Chinese to get money out. And then when they realized it, they shut it down. Um, uh, so I think you're, you're just looking at, um, hopefully it's not going to be a, uh, a digital currency. Um, I think that's, kind of uh, absurd, really. Um, you can wipe out a, a country so easily just with a, an e-impulse, you know, there go their computers and their digital currencies, and how do you even go buy a bottle of milk? Um, What do you, so you think it will be perhaps gold-backed currency, like that the, the, the next dollar or the next currency will be like backed with gold or silver or commodities or what's, what do you think would be the solution to bring back trust into the monetary system? I think, you know, they, they might make it convertible to gold. Uh, I would be against the gold standard because you can't fix it. And when there's a business cycle. Um, even when you look at gold, when it was, uh, freely trading in the 19th century, uh, it's why the gold silver ratio has been all over the place. Sometimes it's been 120 to one and it goes down to 16 to one. It depended upon, um, you know, you just made a major find to silver, then actually silver is going to decline and you made a major find of gold and then gold declines. Um, it, it I would look the real wealth of a nation is the productivity of its people. All right. Uh, Germany rose because its people were productive. Yeah. All right. Not because it had gold. Um, the more you can produce and the more efficient you are, um, you have other countries that have all kinds of resources and they're still third world countries. Yeah. Um, China, you know, the same thing. I mean, Japan, uh, Japan had nothing, um, but its people were industrious. So yeah, we have to look at it from uh, that perspective. I mean, it depends upon, it's always a matter of confidence. Uh, you can make it convertible to gold if that makes some people feel comfortable. Um, but the question is, you know, will the next generation even care about gold? Um, so you think, you think people should own gold in the next couple of years or silver? Um, what about, um, equities, bonds, um, real estate? Yes. I mean, anything that's, that's tangible, like I say, gold or, uh, uh, silver, uh, is fine. I think you're looking at a situation of, um, really where we're, we're dealing with something that has a value, well, you know, if you're going to try and measure it in current terms, that's kind of irrelevant. Um, because you can say, yeah, okay, fine, gold will go up to $5,000. But what would the dollar be at that time? Exactly, exactly. You know, uh, um, One burger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's, it, it's just, it's, you're on the neutral side with that. Debt, if you're looking at Debt of that nature, you, you know, go private. Uh, the major companies that actually have assets, not the, uh, the, you know, the, the ones that are all just, you know, about high tech and really don't have any tangible assets themselves. 
Um, and that's what the takeover boom in the 80s was about. Um, I had was doing seminars and showing people, look, the stock market's going to rally. Uh, that was another one of our forecasts that I said, you know, <clears throat> the market's going to rise from 1,000 to, to 6,000 on the Dow over the next few years that people thought it was, it was nuts. But I said, look at this. <clears throat> when you could buy a stock, sell the company's assets and triple your money, was it overvalued? <laughs> um, that was the whole takeover boom. You know, they made the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas about that, you know. Uh, but they didn't really understand what was causing it. It's just that uh, in 1977 was the low in the Dow versus uh, book value. Um, so for years you had that sentiment after 29, oh, the government's here to, to take care of us, blah, 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 whatever. So um, <clears throat> government debt was was, you know, triple A, you know, stocks were kind of speculative. Uh, so stocks became so undervalued that it was absurd. That was the whole takeover boom in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, stocks are right now um, undervalued or overvalued? Um, probably still undervalued relative to uh, the outstanding national debts. And you also have to understand that the amount of money invested in government bonds is about 10 times that of equities. Yeah. So if everybody really said, I want to get rid of the bonds and buy just equities, I mean, the Dow would probably go up 10 times. Um, uh, I don't expect that to happen right, you know, right now, but I mean, it's just an example. I mean, so, you know, from a, a practical standpoint on a longer term basis, you know, <clears throat> Capital also flees from wherever the event is. So if um, Russia and Europe really get into it, the capital is going to flee to America. Just the way it is. And, and be in the private sector. Um, I said right now that, you know, it's um, I'm in Florida. They call it the real land of the free and home of the brave. Uh, and traffic has doubled from, uh, I would say, in the last three years. Wow. Uh, housing prices have not declined. They continue to rise. Um, and more and more people are trying to get here. Mm. Crazy, crazy. So what's your take on inflation the next couple of years? Will we see another peak, uh, more waves of inflation? Or did we see the peak and it's all over and we see more deflation, actually? Uh, no, we're still looking at inflation probably into 24. As I said, this is because of shortages, not yeah. speculative. So it's different. Um, and <clears throat> raising interest rates only reduces the supply even further. So it's it's we're doing the exact opposite of what needs to be done. So you think the the hikes, the interest rate hikes, are not helping any anyhow uh, with inflation? No, no. So what should the Fed do then? The problem is you need a complete new set of economic theories. Um, Keynesian economics is is collapsing. Um, the reason when Keynes came up with this idea in the Great Depression, the U.S. government had a balanced budget. All right, so raising interest rates affected us. It didn't affect them. But today the governments are the biggest borrowers. So you raise the interest rates, they no longer affect us, They making the government deficits go up even further. Because a politician isn't going to sit there and say, oh, gee, the central bank wants us to spend less. Yeah. Yes, let's reduce our spending. Never going to happen. Okay. That's why Keynesian economics is, is, is ancient history now. It, it's, it is. It is. So which will be the last fiat um, monetary system which will fail? So which will survive the longest? Probably the United States. Uh, okay. Not the franc or I don't know, the no, ruble? No. Okay. And uh, you, yeah? Eventually, I think you're going to find, you know, um, China and, and Russia will probably... Uh, end up surviving more. Our, our computer's been showing that 
the financial capital world will probably move to China. Wow. You think China will invade Taiwan and you think there will be a big war between China and the US? Um, I don't think there's any question that China uh, is going to take Taiwan. I mean, before uh, Biden, we had a, an arrangement. Yeah. Uh, and everybody was polite. And yes, there's only one China. Uh, and you, you, you mouthed that and then they left China alone. Once the Biden administration came in, they basically kicked up the dirt on everything. Um, once you sent Pelosi over there, oh, we're going, we're going to be here to defend. That is basically sticking a, a knife right in, in China's belly. Now all of a sudden you're telling them, no, we're here and we're going to defend Taiwan. And they're going, really? Okay, now they have to go in. They didn't before. Uh, once you take it and start rubbing it in their face, now they have to. Uh, it, it's, like I said, I, I can't believe, um, I mean, you take the whole Russian invasion. Look at it objectively. You ha They sent Vice President Harris over there to the Munich uh She stood up and, and actually said, oh, Ukraine should join NATO. Okay, you just violated one agreement. Then um, Zelensky stands up, and you can Google it. Uh, the day before, on February 23rd, he stands up and says, well, Ukraine, uh, we're going to try and uh, you know, rearm nuclear, nuclear. That night, Putin even put that in his speech before they invaded. Um, the Minsk agreement, you know, you had even had Merkel come out and said, well, we never really intended. We just basically were fooling uh, Putin. Um, I mean, and Putin's the aggressor here. I think, you know, we have a lot of responsibility behind all of this. Mm. Yeah, the and truth, the truth is mostly somewhere in the middle. It's not the one side or the other side. And I think we ha have our part as well on the escalation with the Ukraine war. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's horrible. So you think there will be a solution? What does your model say about perhaps peace in, in, in Ukraine or who will w w win the war? No, um, no, Ukraine will lose, but um, it, it's you're looking at a, a situation that is just it makes it's stupid. I mean, the Russian people are no more interested in occupying in uh, Europe than Europeans are interested in occupying um, Russia or America and China, whatever. Yeah. It's our politicians that that are the problem. Uh, the people, you know, we could care less. It's, I Let me get along with my job and save my family and leave me alone. Um, it's always the, the, the politics at the top that, that make wars. Uh, it, it's not the people. Um, we're just the sheep and follow. Uh, it, it's just unfortunate, but that's the real end of the game. Um so I think the you know the world that that we're looking at we have to you got to crash and burn first before you get to rebuild it correctly. Uh, sounds sounds hor these, horrible. It is they, these politicians have made their decisions and uh, it's all about them. There's and no this way to change this or to stop this. Is there anything we can do or what your model recommends perhaps? I don't think we can ever. Uh, beat its forecast. I think it's kind of set in stone and it's basically, basically moving um, collectively uh, in many different levels. Uh, I think the best that we can possibly do is reduce the volatility, the amplitude. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think probably one of the best things that, that, that could happen is Ukraine gets rid of Zelensky. And actually puts in a real leader that's going to care about the people rather than taking orders from from uh, NATO and, and the U.S. Um, I mean, Zelensky, the people I've spoken to in Ukraine, I mean, they feel that he's a traitor, that he's put the whole country at risk for what? 
um, for an area that's occupied by Russians to begin with. Um, Critics would say, or other people would say, Zelensky or Ukraine um, de uh, defends democracy and um, protects us from Putin and so on. That, that's just neocon propaganda, basically. I mean, um, Zelensky shut down all kinds of press that criticizes him. That's democracy. That's freedom. Um, the dumb boss, he's ordered them that they cannot uh report to the the patriarch of moscow it has to be to the new patriarch that he set up in in kiev he's attacking their religion uh attacks their language and says oh uh ukrainian has to be the number one language not russian um <clears throat> this is not democracy this is nonsense and and you know, saying that, oh, you know, Russia is really just, uh, it's not a democracy. Okay, fine. So the Duma appoints and elects Putin. Who elects the head of the EU? Not you. No, nobody. It's the, the same thing. It's the heads of state vote for the head. Of, the only head of state that's actually voted for is, is in the United States. Any parliamentary system, it's the Parliament that votes who's the their leader, Canada, etc. Yeah, is 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 your model saying something a, a important date this year or the next year which we should um, share with our audience? It's April twenty sixth um, to about May sixth. Uh, I think that's when you're going to see um, this coming to a head. Um, I mean, there is a risk that you, Ukraine can uh, lose and collapse this rapidly. Okay. Uh, and then you have to ask, you know, will the West say, oh, we have to avenge Ukraine? <laughs> um, okay. So this is a war cycle, isn't it? Yeah. Look, just what's the purpose of NATO? NATO said the purpose is to prevent Russia from invading Europe. Well, if Russia was never going to invade Europe, why do we need NATO? All right. Their very existence promotes war. They need to constantly turn up the fear. Otherwise, they don't get paid. They lose their jobs. Um, it's as simple as that. Uh, it, it's, um, it's the same like a Pfizer never wants to have healthy people in the world because then they don't sell any drugs or vaccinations. <laughs> And they certainly don't want to have their, you know, be liable for, for any lawsuits or, um, I mean, look, they've been paying bribes to, to politicians for a long time to, to get exempt from, I mean, I've spoke to one lawyer, he says that, you know, the, the, the two areas that are never accessible uh, are exempted from law are the bankers and pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And you made this um, experience, unfortunately, because uh, you brought the banks against you and the government because you called them a Ponzi scheme. And then um, they put you in prison. And that's what the movie, the forecaster from our dear friend Marcus is all about. And I have to recommend it again. You find the first 30 minutes for free beneath here and you should check it out. And if you want to watch the whole movie, it's only five bucks instead of 20 bucks. It's a special offer for our audience, for our subscribers here, for everybody who watched this uh, today. And yeah, my, my one, two more questions, actually. The, 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 the one is, um, is there any advice you can give to the audience? How should they behave or invest in the next couple of years? Uh, you have to play it, you know, close to the vest. Uh, look to have uh, independent type assets and, um, and understand that if war starts to come in, in Europe, uh, they will use currency controls. Um, they're, they're very concerned about capital flows. And <clears throat> this is their agenda. You know, they, they need to get, you know, push us to the point where they can justify defaulting on, on their debt. When, when Schwab is saying you'll own nothing and be happy, he's marketing it like life insurance. He's trying to make it sound, we're doing this for you. 
All right, when they're really doing it for them. All right. So, all right. so you think there will be war? There will be a war between I don't know the NATO and and Russia or China, and it will be, it will happen in Germany or in in Europe. Yeah, NATO wants war. Okay. Good. There's, okay. Not good, but yeah. Um, I, unfortunately, I have to agree. If I look back in history, if I check the cycles and the war cycle, I, I see the same, actually the same pattern. And if a monetary system dies and we see the end of fiat, we see the end of the US dollar. Um, and there is a war between number one and number two. It's between China and the US. And yeah, there will be war. The most of the times there, there, there was war. And perhaps this one will be the big one. Yeah. Okay, um, Martin, my last question has nothing to do with cycles or uh, with uh, economics or monetary system or war. It's something personal. It's uh, what's the meaning of life for Martin Armstrong? I don't know. I've been, I feel like I've been plucked and stuck in the middle of all this stuff for my whole life. I mean, I, I, you know. <clears throat> Just about every financial crisis since about 1973, I've ended up being called in on. Um, I've met so many heads of state around the world. I mean, it's, <clears throat> I, I think, honestly, I've, I've kind of ended up like the priest in the confessional that sometimes they just need to talk to somebody. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, I just, you know, I figured This has been my fate, and I just got to deal with it. That, that's about it. I mean, that's when I created the model, I had no idea where I'd be doing this today. That's for sure. And I hope you do it more years, hopefully, hopefully uh, much longer. And um, I hope we can repeat this. It was um, extraordinary, very exciting. If you guys like the video, please give it a thumb up and um, share it with your friends, neighbors and subscribe to the channel and check out Marty's website. I put all the links necessary beneath the video in the show notes is um, Armstrong as armstrongeconomics.com. And Marty, thank you for your time and picking your brain was an incredible experience again. Hope to talk to you soon again and see you hopefully soon uh, sound and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, with a lot of wisdom to share with us and our audience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And our website, you don't have to register. You don't have to put in your name. You don't have to do anything. We believe in open source and freedom for everybody. Thank you, Marty. Thank you.